The wet season in Australia's north brings in six months of humidity, torrential monsoonal rains and spectacular storms. Extreme climatic conditions make travelling arduous and often impossible. Most travellers head south at the end of the dry and never experience the strange beauty, the drama and the excitement of the wet. Malcolm Douglas, in his continuing quest for adventure, spent months battling the elements to really experience one wet season. With November, the dry southeast winds swing to the northwest and rain-bearing clouds flood the top end. Roads and tracks are impassable. Dry creeks swell into raging rivers. Vehicles and travellers are trapped in flash floods. The open plains churned into boggy mires. For many of the animals and birds, it's a time of plenty, with food abundant and a limitless supply of fresh water. For those Aborigines who lead a tribal way of life, it's a time to collect bark, for building houses and canoes, and for bark paintings. After months of rain, the grasses growing several metres tall seed. Then suddenly the wind swings back to the southeast and the ominous skies clear, signalling the end of the wet season and the beginning of months of clear, unclouded days. The wet season influence extends over northern Australia, from the Kimberley to the Territory and across to Cape York. Malcolm is to spend the next two months roaming the Northern Territory. Right at the start, the trip almost fails. Cyclonic rains have cut the roads in many places. Malcolm's companion, Greg Prouse, walks ahead along the Great Northern Highway checking out washaways. At river crossings where the road has subsided, cars can float off downstream, a perilous situation for the occupants. In desperation, people will attempt the impossible. driver of this small sedan is trying to reach Perth. Luckily, his vehicle jams on a rock. Malcolm and Greg camp nearby are quick to lend a hand. Without the winch, the vehicle would probably have been totally wrecked, rolling downriver in the rising torrent. The two young men, on holiday from Darwin, are lucky to be alive. So you guys are from Darwin? Oh, the grog. Between the storms, when the waters temporarily subside, the flood damage closes the roads. Bitumen ripped away and craters gouged deep. Malcolm, determined to get through, will have to winch around this wash away. With no trees nearby, a spare tyre is used for an anchor and stranded travellers are only too keen to lend some weight. The tyre, buried deep in the sloppy mud, holds fast, and the vehicle's soon moving again. Take a bit of strain on that winch now, Greg. You're going to see all that winch petrol.
Malcolm and Greg are able to keep going. The other travellers may have to wait weeks for the road repair gang. In the Northern Territory, conditions worsen with some roads permanently underwater for months. Any decision to cross must be made cautiously. Malcolm marks the water level and in the morning there's no perceptible rise. The boat's unhitched. It could cause the Toyota to float and lose traction. Even after gauging the depth several times, Malcolm's still hesitant. Finally, they decide to give it a go. Two tarpaulins, one under the bonnet and one over, should protect the motor. Once committed to a crossing, there's no turning back. A diesel motor is far more reliable in these situations than petrol. The vehicle safely across, Malcolm floats the boat and dinghy over. They're heading for the Roper River, one of the biggest waterways in the Territory. The Roper, flowing east into the Gulf of Carpentaria, is a productive region for barramundi fishermen, and Malcolm's hoping to meet up with his mate, Bob Connolly. It's a long run to the ocean, so fuel is hidden deep in the mangroves for the return journey. Along the river, Malcolm sights a crocodile, dead and bloated. He's appalled, for although crocodiles are now closely protected, they're killed indiscriminately. This reptile, possibly shot by poachers or thrill-seeking hunters, is now a useless, stinking carcass. Near the river's mouth, the only place to camp is on the hot, inhospitable salt pans. For years, Malcolm's heard stories about the giant river groper, and he's keen to see these massive fish for himself. Malcolm and Greg join Bob, the barramundi fisherman, on each tide change when he checks his nets. As anticipated, a massive groper is found entangled. For Bob, they're a nuisance for it's impossible to reset the net until the gigantic fish is freed. Its size and weight make it immovable, and no matter how hard they try, Bob and Greg are unable to shift the fish. It's just too big. In desperation, a rope is tied to a nearby tree and strung through the groper's gills. With the outboard motor in reverse, the fish is pulled slowly from the boat. Crocodiles always hang around the nets, 
and Greg beats a hasty retreat from the water after an unexpected ducking. The groper finally back in the river, Malcolm's keen to have a closer look and moves it into the shallows, hoping that no crocs are lurking nearby. Gropers have the ability to survive for long periods out of the water, and this one appears to recover quickly from its ordeal. It's massive, and the big dorsal fin can inflict a severe wound. Malcolm, satisfied that it will survive, removes the rope, and it heads back into deeper water. Another specimen, freed on the mud, looks dead, but revives back in the water. These groper grow to over two metres and weigh in at an incredible 320 kilos when fully grown. Henry, we're just getting back in the water. Bob Connolly and his crew hate catching groper when they're after barramundi. These men spend up to eight months a year on the river working around the clock, night and day, checking the nets and filleting the catch. The fillets, snap frozen and freighted to Darwin, are eagerly purchased for the top seafood restaurants from Brisbane to Perth. Crocs hang around whenever the men are filleting. Another gourmet delight is the giant mud crab, usually found near the nets where they feed on dead fish. There's a knack to picking them up without being bitten, and Malcolm makes it look easy. The big powerful claws move with amazing speed and can inflict a terrible bite. Even though the crabs live in grey, oozing mud, their meat is succulent and they're always a prized catch. Catfish too are never far from the nets and the freezer boat. Always hungry, they appear whenever there's any surface activity. They even hassle Malcolm as he washes his clothes. After a period of relative calm, storms loom, intensely ominous. For Malcolm and Greg, it's time to go and they head for the plains east of Darwin. <coughs> These northern wetlands are of great interest to Malcolm. They support an infinite variety of wildlife. Water buffalo introduced from Indonesia in the 1820s are now one of the most common animals, causing considerable ecological damage. Recently, efforts have been made to restrict their numbers and range. All the swamps are overflowing. Malcolm and Greg intend to explore the teeming waterways photographing and observing the wildlife. To film the birds, Malcolm attaches a 600 millimeter lens to the camera. The white-breasted sea eagle, a regal bird.
Malcolm and Greg are wary when they leave the dinghy. Even in the shallows, Wiley's saltwater crocs are a camouflaged threat. Preparing to film, Malcolm is host to unexpected guests. Both men are constantly plagued by the vicious, blood-sucking leeches. Passage through the swamps is laborious and a powerful lens is indispensable for fascinating film footage. If you can forget about the leeches, the results are very rewarding. These are black duck. A burdekin duck and pied geese, commonly called magpie geese. Wandering, whistling ducks. A data plays with a leaf. These diving birds with an arrow-like head astonish people who spot them swimming partly submerged. A pied cormorant, another underwater hunter, devours a fish. and pelicans are always fascinating to watch. The leeches' incessant attacks finally drive Malcolm back to the dinghy. Buffalo Wallow halts the vehicle abruptly. She's a decent old bog. Once again, the only way out is to attach the winch cable to the buried spare tyre. Within minutes of freeing the Toyota, torrential rains fall. As the wet progresses, the storms grow more violent and spectacular downpours drench the plains. During the summer months, 1,500 millimetres or 60 inches of rain falls in the north. When the storm subsides, there's the mopping up to do. Clean, fresh rainwater is the only bonus. Malcolm's tent's been flattened by a willy-willy accompanying the rain, but at least his bedroll's dry. Other creatures too have been flooded out. These centipedes fighting over the only dry spot available. The smallest keeps well clear. The more aggressive viciously attacks its companion, driving it off. Ants always anticipate heavy rain and head for the safety of the trees even building temporary homes among the leaves to protect their eggs. <laughs> Buffaloes have no fear of floods. In fact, they need water to survive. They stay partly submerged for hours, splashing water over their heads to disperse the small flies that irritate them. 
Buffalo wallowing, especially during the dry season, is upsetting the fragile ecological balance. They muddy the water, killing off the plants and reducing the water birds' habitat. In areas such as the Kakadu National Park, buffaloes are being exterminated. With the passing of the storms, calm prevails on the floodplains. Malcolm and Greg slowly head out towards Arnhem Land, but it's a battle all the way. The locals have their own transport system. While travelling through the Kakadu National Park, Malcolm and Greg visit the important Aboriginal art galleries. One site at Little Norlangi Rock is of particular interest. The paintings are of spirit figures, Barramundi and the rare pitted shell turtle, a freshwater species from the northern rivers. The Aborigines obviously knew of its existence, but little is known of its habits today. Malcolm's intrigued because he's seen many of these turtles caught in New Guinea, where they're a common food. Back on the main road, Greg misjudges the crossing, drops into a washaway and floats into the current. The force of the current jams the door shut until the vehicle fills with water. Greg is stunned, unable to talk for several minutes. Malcolm tries the winch and is relieved when it works, even underwater. It's a tense couple of hours as the vehicle's dragged onto high ground. Malcolm's apprehensive that the electrical system will shorten the winch fail, but it churns on. An extra 12 volt battery allows prolonged use of the winch. The length of the cable is extended with rope. Fortunately, as Greg sensed that he was in trouble, he switched off the engine. Waters reached the air cleaner, but the motor's undamaged. An added safeguard driving during the wet is an extension for the air cleaner. Then there's less chance of water damage. It's several days before the vehicle's completely checked over, all the equipment dry and in working order again. Along the road, Greg meets one of Australia's most spectacular reptiles, a frilled lizard. With its mouth agape and its frill spread, it can intimidate any predator. A 
As a last resort before fleeing, it rushes the aggressor, as Greg finds out. He's quite happy to retreat as the dragon keeps up the most ferocious display. Nearby, a goanna takes advantage of the soft, damp soil to excavate its burrow. Agile wallabies are common throughout tropical Australia. In some areas, they're a declared pest and shot or poisoned to reduce their numbers. This joey's lucky. It lives in an area that will soon become part of the Kakadu National Park. Malcolm and Greg attempt to drive into Arnhem Land, but find it's impossible. The rivers and creeks are in full flood. Even this crossing on the East Alligator Road, which appears to be relatively shallow, is flowing so strongly that it sweeps Malcolm swiftly away when he tries to gauge its depth. It's impossible to travel further east by road, so Malcolm organises a larger boat and bigger outboard and begins the long journey to visit his Aboriginal friends in Arnhem Land. The boat's launched in the South Alligator River, east of Darwin, and the run to the coast is full of interest. Pelicans, superb flyers, are even more spectacular in slow motion. Malcolm spots a group of antelopine wallaroos, often referred to in the territory as red kangaroos. Gregarious by nature, they spend the heat of the day in the shade, grooming and resting. Ever since Malcolm lived in Arnhem Land when he made his famous adventure film Across the Top, he's been keen to return during the wet to record a number of important survival techniques still practiced by the Aborigines. The bush tracks into Arnhem Land will be impassable for months, and many of the airstrips are underwater. There's no alternative but to travel for days by boat along the northern coastline of Australia. Greg suffers seasickness while Jardy just settles down for a long sleep. It's a tough, hazardous journey. Pounding into an easterly swell for over 12 hours a day. The hot, steamy conditions, the rain squalls and the days of constant travelling takes its toll on Greg and he just can't wait to get there. On the fourth night, Greg's had enough of the rocking boat and decides to sleep ashore. In the morning, it's discovered he's lucky to be alive. Under cover of darkness, a big croc came up through the camp looking for a feed. Malcolm studies the tracks, estimating the croc to be over three metres long, quite capable of killing Greg and dragging him into the water. Jowdy, always chasing fish, is unaware that a big croc may be cruising nearby. Greg, still shocked, spots more danger near the boat, a deadly box jellyfish. The popular name, sea wasp, is very confusing, for they're large and not at all wasp-like. Common along the coast during the wet season, they've been responsible for many deaths. Contact with the long, sticky tentacles causes unbearable pain. Multiple lash-like wheels are raised on the skin and death can result. The effects of the sting are long-lasting and agonising. A 
another long day's traveling brings the men closer to their destination. They stop for a while to stock up with fish to present to Malcolm's Aboriginal friends. The catch will be distributed according to tribal custom. Malcolm's friends live at a small settlement in the bush. He talks to them about recording in detail two aspects of their traditional lifestyle. One, the building of a wet season house, and the other, the construction of a large bark canoe. Both these projects can only be organized during the wet. The people still live in these traditional houses, although canvas and iron are now accepted building materials. It's decided that a new house will be built to be used by Greg and Malcolm until they leave, when it will become the single men's quarters. No nails or twine are used. The roof bearers simply supported on forked uprights. <laughs> Malcolm goes bush with Bullen Bullen and Gira Gira, where bark for the roof is carefully selected. Stringy bark trees are tested for moisture. The bark must peel easily from the trunk. A ladder is quickly constructed and the bark cut free, high above the ground. Such large sheets can only be collected during the wet. Later in the year, the bark is too dry and would split. This is the technique used by the early European settlers. They too found the bark useful in the construction of their simple dwellings. Fibre beanies are roughly woven. The bark sheets are heavy and unwieldy, and it's a long walk back to the building site. <laughs> These bush hard hats will protect the men's heads. <laughs> The bark is waterproof and when positioned will last for years. A floor of straight saplings is laid to complete the dwelling. Malcolm and Greg move in and Gira Gira arrives with another tenant, his pet sulphur crested cockatoo. Yeah, I'm going to go. 
It soon takes over, chewing up anything left lying about. The men use bark offcuts for paintings. These religious symbolic designs appeal to Europeans and finished paintings are sold to museums and collectors throughout the world. Today, it's not unusual for an Aboriginal artist to receive $1,000 or more for a painting on bark. <laughs> Until recently, these huts were used throughout the swamp country, where there were no caves. The raised floor leaves plenty of room for a smouldering fire, and the smoke drifting through the floorboards keeps mosquitoes at bay. <laughs> Malcolm's never sure which is worse, the insects or the acrid smoke. Malcolm arranges for Bullen Bullen and his relatives to construct a large bark canoe. A very tall, straight tree with no knots in the trunk is located. Great care is taken, for the sheet must be very long, big enough for a boat. Bark canoes are rarely constructed today because increasing contact with Europeans and their material culture has brought rapid changes to the Aboriginal lifestyle. Radios, four-wheel drive vehicles, aluminium boats and outboards are eagerly acquired. Malcolm, very conscious that many of the old traditional skills have died out or are no longer practiced, spends considerable time recording these disappearing crafts. After its initial shaping, the bark is left until the following day. Bullen Bullen's first task in the morning is to collect spindly, fibrous stems for bush string. Throughout the bush, there are many kinds of bark that are used for string. Some are even woven together to make rope. A paper bark container is quickly shaped and a mud compound mixed. The sheet is heated over a fire. Bullen Bullen, who learnt these techniques from his father, alternately dries the bark, then dampens it with the muddy mix. And the bark is soon extremely pliable. The bow is held in place by two upright sticks and the twine made earlier used to bind it together. Bullen Bullen and Gira Gira spent their childhood in the bush and learnt the old ways. The other men with Malcolm are intrigued and join in enthusiastically. 
for it's the first time that they've seen a canoe of this size being constructed. The stern too is shaped and stitched. The wire needle replacing the kangaroo bone that was once used. Paper bark jammed in the cracks stops the leaks. For added strength, saplings are lashed along each side. Bullen Bullen and Gira Gira begin the long walk to the river. The small pieces of bark are retrieved for bark paintings. The canoe is even heavier than expected and everyone lends a hand. Within a week, the bark will dry and the canoe will be light enough to be lifted by one man. Finishing touches of wet clay make the final seal. Malcolm knows that this could be the last canoe of its size ever made, and he's keen to see how efficient it is. He's surprised at its stability, for it barely rocks during a mock hunt. The young men soon put the craft to good use, heading off after bush tucker. Turn with ripe fruit for everyone. <laughs> After all the work, it's time to relax. Bullen Bullen and Gira Gira talk of hunting for wallabies, so spears are tested. <laughs> A friendly competition gets underway. Malcolm had been taught to use a woomera and spear by Bullen Bullen's uncle 20 years earlier. There are many near misses and one direct hit. The spear grass is now over two metres tall, and it's seeding. The wet is almost over. Soon the winds will swing to the south, drying the land and clearing the air. For Malcolm and Greg, it's time to go. Malcolm's heading for Darwin, and on to the great sandy desert in Western Australia to spend three months with the Cookager Aborigines. His love of adventure, and for the Australian bush, intensifies year by year.